Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sim Kapoor, and I have the privilege to serve as OU Director of Advancement Communications and External Relations. Before we begin today's renowned lecture, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Menda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our dynamic and visionary Dean, Professor Erica Walker. Dean Walker is an award-winning educator, researcher, and author who joined the University of Toronto from the Department of Mathematics, Science, and Technology at Teachers College, Columbia University, where she served as the, as the Clifford Brewster Upton Professor of Mathematics Education, the director of the Edmund W. Gordon Institute for Urban and Minority Education and department chair. She was named an American Education Research Fellow in 2022. Dean Walker is a champion for student success and is interested in developing new ideas and deepening our commitment to equitable, equitable education and opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Dean Walker to welcome uh, her on stage and to deliver the opening remarks. Ooh, what a beautiful crowd. Good evening, everyone. I hope you all are doing very well. I want to thank Sim Kapoor for all of her wonderful work and for helping us set up this wonderful lecture. I'm so excited and I hope that you are too. I am Erica Walker and it's my privilege and honor to serve as Dean of OAZ. And I am deeply, deeply delighted to welcome each and all of you to this very special gathering. It's my distinct uh, privilege to host the Jackson Lecture which is named after OAC's founding leader, Dr. Robert Jackson. We have over 400 guests joining us online and in person today. Thank you for braving the rain. And it's wonderful to see a full house today here in one of my favorite places on campus, as you know, the OAC Library. <laughs> the OAC Library is the number one education library in Canada. And so it's a very fitting space given Dr. Givens' um, talk that we welcome him here today to OIC for the first time to join us and give us a wonderful lecture. He has friends in the audience from OIC and U of T, so I hope he feels right at home. Professor Gibbons is a distinguished professor of education in African and African American studies at Harvard University. As an interdisciplinary historian, Professor Gibbons research falls at the intersection of the history of American education, 19th and 20th century African American history, and critical theories of race and schooling. His emerging research is developing into two distinct directions. And the first centers on interrogating silences in the archives on black educational history and exploring possibilities for expanding this archive by building on new approaches in digital humanities. Secondly, he is exploring lessons to be gleaned from the history of black teacher associations in support of contemporary efforts that are so important to recruit and retain Black educators. His work explores themes of education, power, and resistance contextually beyond rigid frames that limit where we look for meaningful experiences of teaching and learning. So we are really looking forward to hearing your address, Dr. Gibbons. And without further ado, I welcome you to the stage. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. All right. Um, it's I'm really, really excited to be here um, to share my work with you all. And uh, everyone's been so hospitable here. It's very, very different uh, vibe and in, in, in experience than Boston, where I flew in from, where folks are very, um, you know, slightly kind of antisocial, if you will. Um, <laughs> But I'm excited to share a bit about, you know, the, the direction that my work is going in um, and 
you know, I want to say before I get into the specifics of the comments that I have prepared today, well, actually, first, let me thank um, Dean Erica Walker for inviting me to be here. And also anyone who had a hand in planning this event, um, you know, in, in helping me to get here, particularly um, Sim Kapoor, thank you so much for your hospitality and for helping me, uh, you know, come all this way. Um, but I wanted to share that the comments that I'm going to be talking through today are really emerging from the particularities of the research that I have done and that I am doing on Black education in the context of the U.S., um, but many of the major conceptual themes about power and anti-Blackness when it comes to trying to recover Black histories are relevant to the histories of education in the Americas. Um, there's a lot of th these questions that I'm exploring around the history that I'm doing around African-American teachers in the U.S. are absolutely relevant to the similar kinds of dynamics of race and power and education um, here in the U.S. And if you haven't read the excellent book, Schooling the System, to give a nod to my colleague here, um, which is about Black teachers in Canada, is really a companion to a lot of the narratives that I'll be sharing today. Um, and so the title of this talk, Black Reconstructions, Race, Educational History, and the Problem of the Archive, is both focusing on the specifics of the historical narratives um, that I write about so to tell you some of these stories that I think are important to know, but also going to be talking about process, right? My process as a historian to try to recover these histories that have been buried and erased um, through various kind of processes of the kind of systematic exclusion of Black folks in the academy. So to begin, I want to emphasize this point that there is a peculiar silence in educational research and it has great implications for both theory and practice. The field of education has given little attention to the problem of the archive, right? And these are collections of physical sources systematically preserved and organized for studying the educational past. My sensitivity to silences in the historical record extend from my training in African-American studies an interdisciplinary field that seeks to describe dynamics of Black life and culture with more nuance, clarity, and beauty. Scholars of African-American studies pursue more freedom and justice for all of humanity, especially those most vulnerable in our society. Black studies and education studies, right, because we're here in the context of an education um, in the School of Education, but I think it's important to emphasize that Black studies and education studies are similar in that they are both problem-oriented interdisciplinary fields. And while they maintain a shared commitment to social transformation, it's important to emphasize that Black studies begins from a place of recognizing racial domination as foundational to the social world and a force that must be accounted for in any pursuit of justice and collective flourishing. So, how might a Black studies orientation to the archive invite more expansive visions of African-American educational history? And in asking that question, I'm also interested in what implications might revisions to Black educational history have for national stories, right, across the Americas of education? And so these are the kinds of questions that animate the research that I do on the history of race and education. And my goal of producing more descriptive and illuminating narratives about Black school life has required a methodological approach to account for what we might think of as archival silences. And this awareness informs my reconstructions of the educational past and my interests in how that past relates to our present. Recognizing that there is much to be learned from material sources left behind by African-American educators, students, and communities, I strive to imagine how the archive might be reconstituted to enable new ways of seeing and knowing in my very first trip as a researcher um, to conduct archival research about education presented an unexpected opportunity 
to reflect on these questions that I've just shared. And I wanna tell you a little bit about that um, encounter. So in July, 2013, I came across the autobiography of Sandy Rufus Youngblood. In this 15 page autobiographical sketch, Youngblood discussed his family's history of enslavement, his coming of age during the period of reconstruction in the US, and ultimately his journey to becoming a lifelong educator, having taught in South Carolina, Georgia, and Oklahoma as a public school teacher, principal, and college professor. This intimate story of Black enslavement and educational striving was handwritten on the back of an old estate ledger, a clerical instrument that had been developed to increase the efficiency of record keeping during the slave trade. Youngblood's parents and ancestors would have been taken into account as quantities in the ledgers of the plantation and of the slave ship. And after slavery was abolished, we know from history about the ways that wealthy white landlords and shop owners continued to use the ledger as a tool of anti-Black domination, as a record book for marking up debts owed by Black farmers and sharecroppers many of whom were illiterate and unable to contest such economic exploitation. Sandy Youngblood's decision to write his life over the grid of the ledger challenged past and present Black subjection. His literacy, life, and self-narration all belonged to an educational heritage that critiqued the social order and the use of the ledger as anti-Black technology. I found this ledger in a box labeled Oversized Items in the Sandy Rufus Youngblood collection at the research library at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. This small yet rare collection on Black pedagogy was at the time unprocessed, a fact that reveals distinctive challenges plaguing Black collections from the post-Civil War, er Civil War era. What I mean to say here is that even as Black people began to produce an extensive written record after the period of enslavement, the history of racialized exclusion within the academy, Black economic precarity, and other forms of structural neglect have led to the loss and inaccessibility of archives. Such dynamics in the archive exemplify what one of my colleagues, Sarah Lewis, has come to call negative assembly, which has to do with the excision and exclusion of details, ideas, and historical materials to block scrutiny or skepticism about the foundations of white racial supremacy and the racial order it secured. Thinking alongside Lewis, I assert that though African-Americans in reconstruction and after had more access to literacy, they had more opportunities to narrate the self or to plead their own cause as the first black published newspaper put it. Even as all this happened, the loss and erasure of historical materials did not cease. One cannot assume archival abundance in the afterlife of slavery. And in fact, it's historians of transatlantic slavery who have been critical to my thinking on this subject. These scholars are often forced to rely on records left behind by slave traders to work to produce new stories about the enslaved. But Black people appear in these sources mainly as commodities. They appear in these sources left behind by slave traders as numbers, captive bodies, fungible beings denied their individuality. Scholars like Vincent Brown, Marisa Fuentes, Idea Hartman, Jennifer Morgan, and many more have led the way in contemplating the challenges and the possibilities of reconstructing Black life worlds 
given such violent limitations, structuring the archive that remains. And it's important to note that slavery's archive is problematic not only because the identities of the captives were violently erased and the documents left behind, but also because of the aggressive neglect of sources that did privilege the perspectives and interior lives of the persecuted. So having recognized its limitations, there are some scholars who have turned away from the archive completely towards theoretical and methodological questions about how to read what is not there. And others have worked to develop strategies for interpreting the archive more inventively. Saidia Hartman, for instance, has explored what is possible through a full exploitation of the subjunctive, right? And the English scholars in the room would know that when we say the subjunctive, we're referring to the what if, the could have, the what might have been. And some move beyond the archive completely, choosing to pursue more than material remnants of the past for historical reflection. The embodied, the performative, the literary imagination. Increasingly, fewer people turn back to the archive for more gathering and more mining. But I want, I want to emphasize that a key part of my historical method has been the work I want to go back to the, there we go, thanks. Um, a key part of my historical method has been the work of what I've come to call archival assembly, which has to do with the discovery, preservation, and at times, rearrangement of historical collections to address erasure and archival silences. And these three commitments of discovery, preservation and rearranging archival collections to address gaps in the historical record inform the various research projects I will talk about for the remainder of my comments today. And so this talk, thanks. And so this talk is broken up into two parts, each focusing on one of my historical monograph. And I will also mention an additional project, which is a digital archive I've recently launched funded by a major grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Spencer Foundation. And while I won't be able to go fully into depth um, about that, you know, I, I welcome the opportunity to talk about any of these projects during the Q&A portion for today. So part one, assembling a fugitive archive on black teaching. My desire for a new interpretation of Black educational history began with the textbook. Sorry, go back to, thanks. Began with the textbook. And this is a one of which you see pictured on the screen here being read by a group of junior high students in New Orleans during the 1930s. Um, I knew Carter G. Woodson to be a famed historian the child and student of formerly enslaved people, and the second African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard in 1912. I was also familiar with his most iconic book, The Miseducation of the Negro, which I recently edited for Penguin Classics, making it the first time this book has been published by a mainstream press since its original release in 1933. But while I was familiar with these aspects of Woodson's intellectual contributions, the story of him writing textbooks between 1922 and 1950 and their wide circul circulation among African-American teachers posed a narrative problem for me because it challenged impoverished, impoverished framings of African-American education based on the institutional and ideological histories documenting separate and unequal schooling before the landmark ruling of Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, right, which we're about to um, observe the 75th, um, excuse me, the 70th anniversary of um, in, in about a month's time. And while the kind of histories about separate and unequal schooling, you know, were indeed factual and in documenting the inequitable distribution of resources during the pre-Brown era, it, they only revealed part of the story right, which is one of the things that I came to emphasize in my work. 
They failed to remember the art of Black teaching, a legacy represented by those very textbooks written and published by Carter G. Woodson, who was a school teacher. And while I was impressed with Woodson's contributions, I became mostly concerned with the tradition of teaching that he represented. And it was the story of one educator in particular that forced me to confront the broader social history of Black teaching that made Woodson's intellectual contributions so impactful. And her story is largely undetectable in traditional educational records, instead existing in otherwise places, requiring the work of archival assembly. Tessie McGee read to her class in a steady, measured tone, quietly engaging in a calculated act of subversion. She was Black, 28 years old, and she taught history in, the 1930, in 1933 at the only Black secondary school in Webster Parish, Louisiana. The all-white Department of Education and local school board gave very clear instructions. Teachers were to keep the pre-approved outline openly displayed on their desks, which they were to follow closely to acquaint their students with the targeted learning objectives. Yet on many occasions, Ms. McGee made what she deemed to be necessary revisions to the mandatory curriculum based on her own judgment and perhaps at the recommendation of fellow black teachers, she often read passages from Carter G. Woodson's book on the Negro, which rested comfortably in her lap. She kept this textbook out of sight, understanding that if she were to be caught, she would be vulnerable to the disciplinary practices of Jim Crow authorities, but she was undeterred. And one of Ms. McGee's students from that year recounted, quote, she read to us from that book. When the principal would come in, she would simply lift her eyes to the outline that resided on the desk, and she began teaching us from the outline. When the principal disappeared, her eyes went back to the book in her lap, end quote. Tessie McGee's method of instruction constitutes a textbook example of what I came to call fugitive pedagogy. Fugitive pedagogy consists of African-Americans' physical and intellectual acts that explicitly challenged anti-Black protocols of educational domination. And these were actions that often took place in discreet or partially concealed fashion. And I wanna say a little bit about my use of this term fugitive because I think it's important um, to unpack why I'm using this particular terminology. Uh, my use of the term fugitive draws inspiration from literary scholars like Stephen Best and Saidiya Hartman's discussion of what they call fugitive justice, where they introduced the idea of two competing narratives of the fugitive's identity. And of course, they're writing about the history during the period of enslavement and particularly about fugitive slaves, right? Um, fugitive connotes the dual image of one who escapes enslavement or jail confinement, which justifies his capture even death at the hands of law enforcement. However, the violence of enslavement and legal capture engenders as well, this countervailing narrative of and by the fugitive as a victim of anti-Black domination. Essentially, I'm saying that this, this is a countervailing narrative where Black people develop new standards of justice, new ways of knowing, and we find parallel equally competing historical images when adapting this concept of Black fugitive life to American education or Black education more broadly across the Americas. And it is indeed reflected in the extensive factual counter narratives in Carter G. Woodson's textbook, that very textbook that Tessie McGee was engaging in fugitive pedagogy to secretly teach her students from. But this language of fugitive pedagogy also draws inspiration from the historical archetype of the fugitive slave who emerged as what we might think of as a folk hero in black curricular imaginations. As early as 1890, we find black teachers writing textbooks 
filled with heroic narratives about enslaved black people who absconded from plantations, those who led revolts and stories of maroon communities in the dismal swamps of Virginia, of Virginia, Suriname, Brazil, and Jamaica. And that's not all. It's also clarifying to learn that the very first black author textbooks in the United States were actually published and written by fugitive slaves. James W.C. Pennington, to my far right, um, was an escaped slave from the state of Maryland who became a teacher at the African Free School in Connecticut. And he inaugurated this tradition in 1841 when he published a textbook on the origins and history of the colored people, which represents the beginning of this formalized practice of black people striving to rewrite the system of knowledge. The fugitive slave William Wells Brown also wrote a textbook in 1863. So essentially what I'm saying here is that, you know, as the 19th century witnessed the proliferation of, you know, newspapers, journals, and other forms of print culture, we see how textbooks became tools, not only among masters, but also among fugitive slaves. And so my conceptualization of what I've been calling fugitive pedagogy names much more than just an elaborate metaphor, but it's in fact referencing a phenomenon that surfaced within the archive at multiple levels. So this concept is drawing a narrative line from enslaved people's defiance of, of what we know as anti-literacy laws, right? Enslaved people's defiance of these laws that criminalize black education because as early as 1740, at least in the US, you know, um, literacy was criminalized among enslaved and free black people. This is also a practice that happens in other parts of the Anglophone world, particularly some, in some of the Caribbean contexts. Um, but it's connecting that set of fugitive educational practices from enslaved people to the actions of teachers like Tessie McGee after the Civil War, right? Even after black education becomes technically legal, we know that black people continue to experience various forms of um, constraints, right? And suppression to their education, which required the kind of actions that Tessie McGee engaged in. And I wanna emphasize that fugitive pedagogy was a collective endeavor even when manifesting as individual acts of practice. For example, that teacher entering Miss McGee's classroom was a black man named J.L. Jones. And you can't see these, um, the document, you can't read the words on the screen, um, but we know from records uh, that Principal Jones supported the inclusion of black history and culture at the Webster Parish Training School, this school that she taught at. Um, this is, uh, a document that's talking about the Webster Parish Training School in a journal called the Louisiana Colored Teachers Journal. This is a publication that was um, printed and produced by the all black teacher organization because black teachers were excluded from mainstream white professional organizations. And so we see this principal showing up as a leader in this organization that had been disseminating information about Carter G. Woodson's textbooks to black teachers across the state. Right, so we know that he was a leading member in the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, which had explored, which had explicitly endorsed Carter G. Woodson and his work. Um, and this is uh, a document from the archive where we see Carter G. Woodson was a life member in the National Black Teachers Organization in the US. This is one of many newspaper clippings where Carter G. Woodson is appearing at the um, black teacher meetings at various states in the US um, this is one from Tennessee, but they exist from all over the um, country. And we find these in, the, in Black newspapers. But I'm, I'm providing this context, right, this nuance, to offer the point that it was not implausible then to consider that Principal Jones and Miss McGee may have, very, may have very likely conspired together, right? The, the principal testing the teacher to ensure that she could protect herself and the school if a white official entered the room. Because black educators had to walk a tightrope when challenging such oppressive schooling contexts. Because if they were to fall or be caught, there was no safety net to catch them. And I wanna give a little context to share what I mean here, right? So that we don't think that this is kind of a, an inflated um, point that I'm making. Just a few years, just a few years prior, 
the white school board in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which was heavily influenced by a kind of uh, white supremacist organization we know of as the Ku Klux Klan, had learned that Carter G. Woodson's textbooks were being used in the local black high school. The books were confiscated, the teachers were reprimanded, and the principal's life was threatened and he was forced to resign. And there are examples of this kind of violent oversight that's documented in this newspaper account um, from you know, just a couple of years before that incident that I recall from Tessie McGee. But I wanna share that you know, this is one of many kind of accounts that we have that black teachers were, were aware of about the way that they were surveilled in the context of schools. Black teachers were routinely targeted and fired for challenging white supremacy. Some notable examples of this being Ida B. Wells, who was fired as a teacher in Memphis, Tennessee in the 1890s. Ida B. Wells is most um, commonly known for her work as an anti-lynching activist when she became a journalist. Um, but this is after she had been fired as a teacher in terms of her anti-lynching campaign and work in the 1890s. Um, John W. Davison, who's fired from a school that he founded in the early 1900s in Georgia um, for teaching Latin, not for teaching African-American history. That's a whole nother story about the kind of um, suppression of what was thought of as kind of liberal arts education in black schools, but also Anna Julia Cooper, who's uh, demoted as the principal of the first black public high school in the US in Washington, DC, at a time when this school, that the students at this school are outperforming local, you know, white students in the local schools in Washington, DC, but also the iconic case of Septima Clark, who's fired because of her political activism in the NAACP. And yet, I think it's important to emphasize that there were some teachers who lost more than their jobs. Harry and Harriet Moore were fired in 1946 and later killed when their home was bombed on the same date as their wedding anniversary in Mims, Florida. Black teachers' awareness of such stories prompted them at times to conceal their pedagogical objectives even as they developed strategies to contest this violent reality. For instance, teachers like Tessie McGee were connected through what the sociologist Alden Morris has come to call insurgent intellectual networks. These were institutions like the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which Carter G. Woodson founded in 1915 um, while he was working as a public school teacher. And this is the same organization that founded what we know today as Black History Month. Um, that's Black History Month was founded as Negro History Week by teachers through this organization that Woodson created and that, that was founded in the 1920s. But also, you know, I'm referring to these colored teachers associations also as insurgent intellectual networks. Such organizations comprised a veiled yet networked black educational world. And it's through these institutions that teachers engaged with intellectual resources by black scholars, and they used these spaces to organize against forces of domination that infringed on their dignity as educators. And again, you cannot make out the text on this screen, but I, this is, um, an excerpt from another one of those issues of the Louisiana Colored Teachers Journal. This one is from 1935. And if you were able to read the text, you would see that these are lists of black teachers across the state in the 1930s, organized by grade levels where they're reading new scholarship published by black scholars like Carter G. Woodson, W.B. Du Bois, and, and you know, African-American writers of novels and literature to figure out how they can infuse the curriculum in their classrooms with this new scholarship being produced by black thinkers, even as this was certainly not being included in the formal curriculum that they were being given by state departments of education. Um, but again, this is this reflective of that kind of intellectual network that these teachers were a part of. And so after learning that Tessie McGee's principal was a leader in the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, I decided that I wanted to seek out the records of colored teachers associations across the United States so that I might assess the reach of Woodson's influence. And I decided to do this because I was met with a lot of skepticism by my fellow um, historians at the kind of traditional, you know, history academic conferences. Like, you know, are you sure that this teacher, Tessie McGee, was not just an outlier, like this one individual teacher doing this? How can you be sure that this was happening across in, in the, you know, Black teachers during this period? 
And so I wanted to get more sources like this to help me document and say that this is a part of a, an expression of a particular form of black pedagogy that is actually is, was quite um, expansive in black education. But what I found after traveling to more than a dozen states in the US and Washington DC was deeply concerning. Some records were cataloged and easy to access, but the majority were unprocessed or existed in bits and pieces scattered across multiple historical repositories and personal collections. Sometimes I was told that these materials did not exist after driving from New Orleans, Louisiana to Jackson, Mississippi on a hunch only for a near complete collection to later be discovered in an old plastic bin rotting away in a closet. Sometimes the Journals of Colored Teachers Associations sat on shelves in libraries as ordinary reference material despite their fragility and historical significance. And as you can see, the kind of state and condition of some of these materials require um, a lot of attention and care to make sure that they're preserved. Recognizing the disorderly nature of this archive, I decided that my work as a scholar included the custodial task of securing the long-term preservation of these collections. To insist that an archive remains for subsequent generations of scholars who will exceed my work and indeed my lifetime. So since 2018, I've been building the Black Teacher Archive, which entails locating, cataloging, and digitizing the serial journals and publications of colored teachers associations. And this digital archive, I don't know if your phone will pick up the QR code, but if it does, it'll take you to the, this on the open access portal where these materials are now housed. Um, but if not, we can make sure to you know, circulate that around so that folks can have access to it. Um, but we launched this uh, archive in October of 2023, and it is an open access online portal. And to date, the BTA is the largest digital repository of material on African American, on African -American uh, teachers and education. And it's important to note, I just wanna emphasize a little bit about the scope of the work. The Black Teacher Archive consists of more than 50,000 pages of written materials by African American educators. And based on our estimates, approximately 2,500 issues of Colored Teacher Association journals were published up and through the period we know as Jim Crow, which is the greater part of the 20th century. And of this number, we've located, digitized, and processed nearly uh, you know, just shy of 2,000 issues of these journals at this point. And the publication dates range from 1907 to 1973, and the journals representing 15 states in Washington, D.C., were collected from more than 70 different historical repositories, libraries, and personal collections. So in short, I wanna emphasize that with the Black Teacher Archive, we have assembled this archive in digital form that does not and cannot exist as a physical, as a physical collection, right? And I'll be happy to say more about the kind of technical aspects of that work during the Q&A if folks are interested in hearing more about it. Um, but for now, I wanna show a quick trailer about the project that will give you a little more insight about what it entails. We've been missing a very, very important part of the Black freedom struggle by not including teachers front and center in that story and elevating the work of educators when it comes to Black struggle. Black Teacher Archive is this digital portal that houses the records of colored teacher associations, particularly their journals. These are digital representations of these physical materials that exist all over the country. We're trying to provide a different form of access and also honor the care that's not even provided to the student. We're taking advantage of what it means to live in the digital age and with the hopes to kind of revitalize this aspects of tradition, but also to say there are things that we can do now that couldn't be done 20 or 30 years ago in terms of important things that can happen is that allows us to tell much more robust stories about the role that teachers played in all aspects of Black life. 
when people think about the civil rights movement, teachers are not necessarily the people that come to mind. They're all these individual figures. But then when you sit back and wonder, well, where did all of these great and important leaders come from? When we think about their oratorical skills, right? When we think about their ability to imagine a world outside of the confines of Jim Crow, where did they learn that? Despite the extraordinary blooming that has happened in African American studies, we are still mining for the stuff of the tradition that we need to do to fashion, shape the field, to tell the story. I do think that this project is yielding a lot of gold. I want to just kind of like wrap up this You know, I want to say that my assembly of the Black Teacher Archive began with the story of Tessie McGee. This is a story that I found unexpected. A video recording of Miss McGee's student preserved in a personal collection at a church in Prince George's County, Maryland. Ms. McGee's story reminded me that Black teachers, students, and communities have histories that can be traced back, and that their stories are worthy of thick description, and that to do so requires the assembly of new archives that provide windows into the interior life of Black education. Ms. McGee's story also reminded me that despite the aggressive neglect Black, Black people experience in education, their stories are not to be looked upon with contempt and pity. For fugitive pedagogy had long been part and parcel of Black teachers' professional disposition. This I was reminded of, not in a research method seminar, not while visiting the Library of Congress, not while studying a special collection at a historically Black college, and it was not retrieved from box files and folios in a quiet, pristine university library, like this one we're having today. But I encountered these lessons in a fugitive archive, tucked away in a crawl space of a storage room at a Black Baptist church. And so for my final comments, I want to talk about an assembly of Black students extending from this narrative about archives, about Black teachers, to the implications this has about um, students. It was a student perspective, as I shared earlier, that led to my conceptualization of fugitive pedagogy and my assembly of a fugitive archive. It was 16-year-old Jerry Moore who took note of Miss McGee as she removed her mask of compliance, as he documented how, quote, her eyes went back to the book in her lap. Black students were always watching. While the field of education is in theory a student-centered enterprise, in practice, our writing about the history of education has not centered student perspectives. The field has mostly focused on the history of institutions, curriculum and ideologies, major theorists and reform movements. Yet first-person accounts by Black students became central to my thinking about African-American teachers and fugitive pedagogy. I quickly realized, however, that this vast repository of knowledge had much more to offer. Therefore, I built my second monograph around the voices of Black students. School Clothes, a collective memoir of Black student witness, explores what it has meant to be a Black student in the context of American schooling. And it relies on more than 100 student accounts from the 19th and 20th centuries to explore key themes in the history of Black education. Debates about intelligence, conflicts between education and racial capitalism, desegregation, literacy, political activism, and more. School clothes is a reconstruction of Black educational history from a student perspective. Because for so long, Black students have been written about. 
and held under a microscope, picked and prodded as specimen for study. They have been held in prolonged gaze and rarely have those gazing felt the risk of black students looking back. But black students have always been watching and speaking and writing and singing, striving to give an account of themselves and the entangled relations structuring the social world around them. So across a range of scattered historical materials, we find black students insisting that they have always been more than mere objects of history, but instead its subjects. School clothes is about students witnessing as a mold of black study. The book is made up of hand-me-down stories, pieces of memory passed on, stitched together and offered to, as something to be taken up again as though for the first time. And I call this work a collective memoir because the individual stories become a communal utterance. School clothes foregrounds the chorus comprised of shared voices and shared vulnerability. And so here is the assembly of students across time and space. A poem on slavery, written in 1828 by George Allen, a 12-year-old student at the African Free School in New York City. George handed in a written assignment that was so striking, the white schoolmaster questioned its authenticity and subsequently required George, whom he described as, quote, a very black boy of pure African descent, end quote, to produce a piece of poetry on any subject he pleased. This schoolmaster proceeded to lock George in a room for 30 minutes, forcing him to prove his ability, a ritual of validation that resembled the trials of Phyllis Wheaton, an enslaved girl who became the first African-American and woman in the US to publish a book of poetry. And we know that in 1772, Phyllis Wheatley was required to stand before a panel of 18 of Boston's most distinguished men, nearly all of whom owned slaves, to prove her intellectual ability because they questioned whether she could have produced the poetry that had been published under her name. Such exams were always about more than proving their individual intelligence, but instead the assessment of an entire race. A song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, written by school principal James Weldon Johnson, but sung publicly for the very first time by 500 Black students in the year 1900. This song was spread across the country, eventually becoming what people in the US refer to as the Black National Anthem. But as Principal Johnson explained, quote, it was the school children of Jacksonville who kept singing the song. Some of them went off to other schools and they kept singing it. Some of them became school teachers and taught it to their pupils, end quote. This song is a cultural artifact embodying a migration narrative of Black pedagogy, one where generations of Black students are vessels ensuring its survival. A memoir by Ida Mae Holland of Greenwood, Mississippi a child of the 1940s and 50s, who describes how white education officials often shorten the black school year calendar to ensure that the hands of black children were available to work as field hands and pick cotton. Ida Mae also recounts exchanging lurid stories in the bathroom with her classmates about things they witnessed while working as domestics in the homes of local white families. She details the distinct vulnerabilities that Black girls experienced in such places, a kind of race and gender violence that she knew all too well. As another student emphasized, Black families' awareness of such stories prompted them, and it, you know, and it increased their fervor for education, writing that, quote, they wanted for their children emancipation from ditch digging, the wash tub and domestic service and menial labor in general, end quote. Ida Mae Holland's account echoes assessments by contemporary scholars who assert that domestic work for black girls continued to carry the stain of slavery through the era of Jim Crow, declaring that the kitchen 
was the field and the brothel, still a carryover from the house of bondage. Idame's witnessing provides a searing account of racial capitalism's intrusion in the lives of Southern African American students and Black girls in particular. A letter written in 1951 by a highly literate 10 year old Yvonne Hutchinson, my former high school English teacher, to her grandmother, Mama Sissy, back home in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Yvonne describes her experiences attending a recently integrated elementary school in Los Angeles, having just moved from Arkansas, where she had attended the school named after the fugitive slave Frederick Douglass. Yvonne is amazed that Black people can sit wherever they want on buses in Los Angeles. And most of all, as she writes that, quote, here in California, they let Negroes go in the library, end quote. She also details with great joy seeing an issue of Jet Magazine for the very first time, declaring to Mama Sissy that, quote, will you believe it? All the people in it are colored, and most of them are real famous people, like that singer, Nat King Cole and that boxer, Joe Lewis, end quote. Assembly is a loaded word in the history of Black education. For indeed, the criminalization of Black assembly has long been a marker of Black Americans' civic estrangement. My gathering of student voices refuses a legacy of what we know as anti-assembly laws and social customs in the United States. And such prescription anticipated what I referred to earlier as these anti-literacy laws. For instance, Colonial Virginia established its very first anti-assembly law in 1723. This became state law in, 19, in 1804, excuse me, and later revised in 1819 to explicitly prohibit, quote, meetings or assemblages of slaves at any school for teaching them reading or writing either in the day or night, end quote. Whether it be an assembly of black learners during slavery, an assembly of civil rights protesters, an assembly of black students sitting together at the cafeteria table, standing on a corner after school, at a park on the weekend, or the assembly of activists to protest police killings of unarmed African Americans. This right to assembly for black people has always been a contested privilege. And my work of archival assembly is informed by the weight of this past. By looking back, African-American students cast a black gaze on the historical record that reveals the violence of the world around them. Yet these students' insistence on remembering and passing on accumulated knowledge also reveals the beauty they encountered, the lessons they learned, the songs they sang, and the freedom dreams they manifested. And when gathered together, these artifacts become much more than just a collection of past material, but instead an anticipation for a collective memory to awaken. Thank you. And again, I'm happy to talk about, um, I know I covered a lot in the talk, anything that I covered in the talk, uh, quickly that you wanted me to unpack or clarify or anything you wanted to expand on as well, I'm happy to address. Okay, um, first of all, I was a little discombobulated because I was reflecting and making connections. So thank you for that beautiful talk. 
What a pleasure. Um, so we have um, some mics. So we will take a few questions uh, for Dr. Gibbons. Yes, Dr. Adibo. Thank you so much for your so much very fascinating talk and work. I have a question about the historical method in relation to your talk. Not just the methods, but historical methodology. So the kind of the philosophical underpinning of methods that you have engaged, for example, your approach, approach to feed utility and feed utility. As it happens, I'm thinking uh, thoroughly, apparently, about uh, yeah, history, black history, but more so historicity, methods and methodology, and what are useful ways, methodologies, then to understand, to analyze, read, and reread black historicity and also rescue, rescuing black history and historicity. And because in, unfortunately, you know, in the context of ongoing wars in the black diaspora, black historical archives and even sites are being destroyed. So my question is how to rescue black history through which Methodol historical methodology, and uh, which also means, I believe, what is the merit? I know the merit, I would like you to elaborate on that more of your historical methodology, the archival assembly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, what is the merit? Rescuing history where any digital work is not possible in the context of war, but also in relation to the broader black diet. Yeah, that's for the Thank you so much. Yes. That's a good question. Um, you know, I, it's a very rich question, you know, and lots of layers to it, but I'll, I'll try to tackle kind of like parts of it. Um, one thing for me that became really important was reading a lot of scholarship on um, conceptualizing and theorizing that there are things that can be known about the past and that there are also limitations to what we can recover from what has traditionally been thought of as historical sources, right? Um, so there are books like Michelle Rock Triol's Silencing the Past, writing the style of writing, particularly coming you know, from the French form context, writing about um, Haiti, um, that helps us think about how silences have historically been manufactured in archives, right? It's not just about, um, and he talks about the different stages at which silences are manufactured, right? It's the moment of, you know, when events happen, people make decisions about what should be kept and what are worth throwing away, right? Whose voices are worthy of being preserved and whose voices are not worthy of being preserved. Um, and then the kind of creation of archives and how they're organized and things like that. So essentially, first thinking about history and the kind of in a procedural way, right? And how that kind of archival work happens. And then me as a historian, where I choose to look for materials. Do I only choose to go to formal archives, right? Um, to kind of look and gather information to write about the past? Or how do I take seriously those silences and look at places that are not that were not traditionally pointed to to try to do the work of recovery and, and memory, right? So for instance, you know, reading a lot of work by you know, black uh, writers, whether it be novels or, or playwriters or, you know, or poets who were people who lived through these experiences of black education and are reflecting in many ways through their literary contributions on the educational experience they have, even if it's not, you know, even if it's in the kind of a fictionalized way, right? So Zora Neale Hurston in the U.S. context, for instance, writing about the way black people navigated power in Jim Crow schools becomes very instructive to how I think about Black people as they're reflected in these very kind of flattened ways in traditional documents. So, whereas a lot of historians historically wrote about Black teachers as accommodationists, you know, doing what they're told because they didn't want to lose their jobs. If you go to the public school records, yeah, that's what you would see. The teachers complied with what white Jim Crow school authorities required for them to do. So you have a whole body of scholarship that said that Black teachers were complicit. 
But then, anyone who knows anything about Black people, how they navigate power, how oppressed communities navigate, you know, authority in these contexts, would be taught to kind of question these sources that are official sources, right? Um, and so, for me, it has to do with taking this kind of common sense knowledge that I learned from, you know, outside of historical sources to kind of read things that show up in the documents or to even question things that show up in traditional documents and not take them at face value, right? How do I take seriously what Black people have said about their lives, about power, and how do I read historical documents for more than just what's on the page, right? How do you read between the lines of historical sources as well? Um, to that other point, when you say the merits of this work of archival assembly, I appreciate that question because it's, you know, some people are saying this overemphasis on the written record will continue to reproduce silences because we know that there are things that are not documented in the historical record um, in an extensive way, right? We don't know the full extent, we'll never be able to document the full extent of certain things that Black people experienced during the period of enslavement or even during the period of Jim Crow when they intentionally did not write everything down publicly because they were working to subvert it. Um, I understand those concerns, but at the same time as a historian, I'm also committed to still seeking out archives because Black people themselves insisted on documenting their experiences to leave behind a record because they understood the importance of it. So I refuse to abandon the archive just because there are limitations with it, but I want to take those limitations seriously, even as I'm engaging in historical methodology to do this work, right? So it's not either or for me, it's taking seriously those kind of concerns that a lot of folks really from the like, you know, performance studies, literary criticism has offered, right? For me to read archival sources in different ways, to name the silences, um, but not to abandon the materials that are there. Um, and to the point about the diaspora, there's some really exciting work that folks are doing around, particularly with the access to technology around um, preservation um, on the continent, for instance. I know some you know, folks in South Africa that are doing some interesting work. And also, um, I just went to the um, Oswald, which is the study for the African diaspora that was in Accra, Ghana. And there's a lot of community archival work that's happening there as well. Um, so I think, you know, certainly limitations, but it's still very promising. One of the challenges with diaspora is like, a lot of the sources that people have to rely on are colonial records, right? Our records from one of the things about the kind of colonial project is that just like the ledgers, they were very intentional to document and create, you know, very sophisticated bureaucratic structures that were created for the economic um, purposes of these colonial enterprises, right? So there's a lot of written records related to that. So one of the challenges that does come when it comes to doing work in the diaspora has to do with not over relying on, on the sources of the kind of colonial regimes to try to tell these stories, but how do we think about the utility of those sources, but also thinking about in a ground up way about what a history from below can look like um, in that context. It was a very long response, so a very rich question, and I'm a lot shorter in my next response. I'm sorry. All right, we've got time for one more question. Let's go to the back in the very back. And can yes, you take two questions and I'll respond in part to both of them? Can you see both questions? Okay, Professor Gibbons, lady in the back for you. Um, hello, I just wanted to ask if there is another particular artifact in your archives that you would recommend for Canadian educators to support them in their anti-Black racism, or sorry, anti-racism work. Um, like you mentioned the song, you mentioned Vincent's book. Is there something that stuck out already with the research you've done? Um, for the Canadian context? I mean, if I personally, I would ask if there was, if you've seen a connection. Yeah. Like, well, I, well, the connection, so that book that I recommended early, earlier, Schooling the System, is an excellent book to kind of engage in that. There's also a scholar, Rachel Zellers, who has some really, um, at least one article I know that comes to mind that's really, um, I find to be very generous for thinking about these similar kinds of questions, both about the archive about the history of anti-blackness in the Canadian context and the early development of public schooling that are really useful. So I would say, you know, the, that work I think is really um, useful to kind of go to here. But honestly, I think one, one of the things that I'm really impressed with the archive is the kind of sheer abundance of the documents 
that these black teachers were doing there, I think that that provides the kind of evidence um, of the kind of activity that black folks are engaging in well beyond the US. In the Canadian context, there are folks that have been reaching out from parts of the Caribbean that are like, you know, all of these black teachers that were engaging in important work in the Caribbean after independence, right, there's a need to preserve a lot of that material. And I have a couple of doctoral students that are doing some interesting work um, in the Caribbean context and also in the UK. But I think maybe looking to this, not for the purposes of like stopping there, but also saying this is ongoing work that also needs to, to happen in these various different locales because, you know, communities are not just victims of racial domination, but they're always engaging in kind of practices of resistance, even when that those stories are not immediately um, accessible. Um, thank you very much, Professor Gibbon. Oh, one more. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Professor Gibbons, thank you for your lecture. It was very human, informative, and eye opening. Um, so, my question has to do with the term um, fugitive um, pedagogy. Uh, I just wanted to clarify um, if this use of the term is it meant to highlight the pedagogy that was practiced during the post enslavement or the Jim Crow era? And the reason why I ask is because um, I'm just slightly concerned about the term. Um, the concern stems from the fact that even something such as uh, the term slave, right, mm -hmm. or slave, I don't particularly like that term because I don't think it aged very well. I prefer to use the term enslaved person. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm sure you've heard that argument before. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think a lot of time spent when we're studying like African history, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Africans in, in, on the continent or in the diaspora, I think a lot of time spent like highlighting. Um, History associated with slavery, right? And I think more time should be spent um, highlighting history as pre-colonial, like pre-colonial African history. Right. So that's why I'm asking that question: if the term fugitive pedagogy has to do with a specific era, then I understand the use of the term and why it's valuable and, and why it's of, of the essence, right? Yeah. But if it goes beyond that, uh, like uh, it doesn't. I don't think. I guess my question has to do with: Do you think it will age well? Mm -hmm. Because um, look, like you know, maybe four years from now, looking back, if I'm so uh, troubled by the term slave, imagine how four years from now, uh, you know, a younger version of me, yeah, uh, would be troubled by the term fugitive pedagogy, uh, especially since in pre-colonial Africa, for example, uh, the the type of pedagogy that we practice, for specifically in ancient Egypt, for example, you didn't have like a student that remains at his or her master's feet for 40 years. For a year, she's considered a master. And these are the type of things that we should keep in mind when we're studying. So, you know, don't get so freaked out that you have four years of school because, you know, you still have four years. Yeah, I understand the spirit of the question. I, 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 I appreciate it. Thank you. That's my question. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and I, I think this is a really important point that comes up. And for me, you know, I had some kind of thoughts about that as well. What does it mean to kind of use the language of fugitivity to talk about um, these experiences? But I would say that it's not only confined to the period of enslavement, but as I mentioned in the talk, it's also talking about after the period of enslavement, because Black communities, can, you know, their education efforts continue to be met by violent white resistance. So for instance, between after the Civil War, between 18, 66 and 1876, more than 630 Black schools were burned down in the southern states in the US, right? Um, so in that context, Black folks continue to have to engage in subversive educational practices because they continue to be met by this violent white resistance. I would also say I understand and I appreciate the concerns that people have about um, narratives about slavery and emphasizing that. I sometimes push back on that a bit. Um, because, and this is this is some, you know, I think that there is something very particular to the development of education and kind of racialization in the modern context, right? That is developed through the experiences and the structural events of chattel slavery. Um, I don't believe in reducing black people to the idea that they were properly, but structurally, that is the material reality that they navigated, even as they resisted. It. 
I actually find the history of fugitive slaves to be one of the most inspiring aspects of Black history in the context of the U.S. that is about a refusal of that very position that you're raising, right? So, which is why when I point out in the curriculum, these teachers themselves, as they were teaching about slavery, they weren't only teaching about enslaved people as property, but they were holding up these narratives of people like, you know, Ellen, you know, Harry Tubman, Sojourner Truth, uh, Frederick Douglass, at, who were fugitive slaves, right, as a kind of, in a heroic fashion, right, these people who refused this position in this category of the, of, of the enslaved person, right? So fugitive slaves are in many ways um, a part of that resistance um, and as a part of a, I think a very inspiring part of black history in the Americas that I would not abandon, right? And it doesn't, that doesn't come at the expense of pre-colonial black history. I think it's important to talk about that, but I also think we can talk about what black people did in the context of the Americas that is also inspiring and important to study and learn from. And so I don't have any qualms about um, appropriating the history of people who were considered uh, criminals during the period of enslavement who, who laid the foundation for Black education, right? The first texts in the Americas were written by fugitive slaves, from Alado Epiano to Fre Frederick Douglass to people like Sir Gernot Truth, the very like basis, the literary basis of Black education in the quote unquote new world emerges from the, the position of fugitive slaves, people who refuse the category of enslavement. Um, and so that for me is what the term indexes and holds in place. And so hopefully I think that will age well because it gives us a way to talk about the violence of enslavement and black agency at the same time. And I think the language of fugitivity holds both of those things in tension. Thanks for an excellent question. <laughs> Um, thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to all the folks online who have joined us. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Gibbons again for our wonderful talk, thought provoking and compelling. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank um, Janaya Webb and the Boise Library for hosting this event. Our folks in Education Commons and our AV team for a wonderful job. And of course, Sim Kapoor and her team for putting all of this together. Um, thank you again for coming. I'm going to present Dr. Gibbons with a gift. I'm going to put this mic in. <laughs> Um, that concludes our evening. Um, I hope that Dr. Gibbons has a moment to have um, share some, some thoughts with folks who want to greet him. But thank you so much for coming. If this is your first time at OAVE, welcome. Come back. We'd love to see you again. And to all the OAVE faculty, students, staff, alumni, and friends who made it, thank you so much for coming. Have a good night. <laughs>